Today we're back at Hodinkee headquarters for another episode of Reference Points. And today we're not talking about the Submariner, but instead the Sea Dweller from Rolex. With us is Louis Westphalen, our vintage watch expert. So Louis, tell us a little bit about the, the Sea Dweller. So you mentioned the Submariner. The Sea Dweller is kind of like an incredible Submariner because it was aimed at going twice as deep as the Submariner. Okay. So you're taking one of the best dive watches ever made and you're making it twice better in a way. So if you could, let's walk through a little bit of the, the lineage of, of the Sea Dweller here. Sure, so the, the Sea Dweller started with the reference uh, 1665. It's also called often the double red Sea Dweller because the first dials had those two red lines. That's not exactly correct in the sense that you had some, now they're considered more prototypes with a single red line. Uh, those are extremely rare. On the and case, extremely expensive for them. Yes, yes. They, definitely. And on the case back, there is a difference with the single red where you see patent pending and the double red Sea Dweller where you see Rolex patent. Mm -hmm. Because Rolex had applied for the patent in 1967 and you know at the time it had not been granted. And so to be clear, there are some double red Sea Dwellers that are also patent pending. So any watch made in 1967 or early 1968, whether it's single red or double red, could say patent yeah. pending. And what's interesting with the double red Sea Dweller, you have a lot of dial variation. Collectors counted up to seven. That also includes the service dials. Right, and so you, you'll often see when you're looking at Sea Dwellers online, it'll say Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3, Mark 4. This is, as, as Louis mentioned, kind of the most wide range of, of different dial variations yeah. of, of any Rolex, really. You know, we've seen Mark 1 and Mark 2, Paul Newman Daytonas. This goes well beyond that into, into Mark 7, which to me feels like a little much. Yeah. Small differences that make a difference in the end. And I think you see something really characteristic of the Sea Dweller going forward, the lack of Cyclops. You see the date, but no Cyclops to, to emphasize it. And one thing also is uh, this silver, silver date disc that would last until the, the next generation. Then you actually stay with the reference 1665, but you go into um, a watch that's called the Great White. It's the same type of case, and the very difference besides the, the, the white writing is the disappearance of the Submariner 2000 on the dial. So suddenly you really have the rise of like a complete line. It's a uh, totally new model. Say. Exactly. Right. So similarly with the 1680, which is the, the date Submariner, which is certainly a more understood reference, you have the, the red Submariners around the same time that you have the double red Sea Dwellers, and then that also transitioned to white. Exactly. And then you move to a reference that changes everything. The reference 16660. It's nicknamed the triple six from the reference number. And it's really the leap into modernity for me. It's introduced in 1978 and you see it's completely different in form factor. Right. You still have you know, the matte dial painted indexes, at least in the beginning, but thicker case, much bigger allium valve, and that's the big change, the sapphire crystal. It's not the first Rolex watch to have a sapphire crystal, but it's among the first ones. And it changes things in the way that if you add both, the death rating just double. It's a watch that in the end changed to glossy dials as well, with uh, white gold surround. So you can find this reference with both. Exactly. Similarly to the 5513, which you can find with yes. both. Yes, and it's interesting to, or it's, no, it's crucial to know the difference and the timing. Basically, the change is around 8.5 million in serial, so uh, 84, because the service dials are also glossy with gold surrounds. So any triple six that you have with a glossy dial and a gold surrounds that's before 84, that's basically a service dial. And there are many of those. And so to me, like this is modernity, because if you compare to, to what has been uh, brought up after, the changes are not that big. Especially if you go to the next reference, 16600, which was introduced at the end of the 80s and one of the longest standing Sea Dweller ever made. You kind of have the same type of case, same type of dial, same depth rating. It's a bit more modern and you know, at, then it, it gets the, the upgrade in Luminous. So it goes from Tritium to Luminova to Super Luminova, but you know, it looks fairly similar. The really big change that happened was this big guy. This is the reference 116660. It's a sea dweller, but it's also a deep sea. And deep sea refers to, I would say, the prototypes made by Rolex in the early 50s through the 60s. Right. Um, and those watches went really, really deep, up to like 3,000 meters the first time, 10,000 meters the second, but they were not worn. They were put on the side of a uh, submariner. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't look 
like any other sea dweller. Mm -hmm. It's much bigger. You're talking about a diameter that went from 40 millimeters to 44. The thickness is almost double, I would say. It was released first in 2008 with a, a black dial, and then uh, in 2014 was released with a deep blue dial to commemorate James Cameron dive. That said, the sea dweller, like the simple sea dweller, never really disappeared from the Rolex liner, in the sense that it came back in 2014 with the reference 116600. So from 2008 to 2014, there was not a traditional sea dweller in the catalog? No, there was the, the bigger. The big the boy. Bigger, yeah, exactly, the okay. big boy. And then this one came up and gathered a lot of excitement at first. It's pretty much the, the modern evolution. We went back to a 40 millimeter diameter, but it gets the ceramic bezel and bigger indexes, upgraded luminous material. So it's very much like the modern, the modern sea dweller. It gathered a lot of interest in when it was launched, also because the lugs were thinner than on the regular Submariner. So it really kept the form factor of the whole lineup of the Sea Dweller. Then something happened. It was discontinued to give way to the very new Sea Dweller, reference 126600, that had a lot of changes. The most obvious one is the Cyclone, which had never been in any sea dweller. Then the case got bigger. Not as big as 44, but 43 millimeter. And in that sense, it kind of like departed from all the sea dweller that we've looked at so far. That said, there is also something that ties it back to the very first uh, sea dweller. Mm -hmm. That's the single red line. The one we had mentioned about the prototype, it's back and it's, it's a nod from, from Rolex about you know, the, the whole history. And it's a nice nod because we're talking about a watch that's exactly 50 years old. It's also bigger, so it's more distinctive in comparison to the Submariner. And I think this is where the Sea Dweller was struggling traditionally. It's an amazing watch as a tool watch. It's, it's really the watch you want if you're diving in saturation di diving situations. But at the same time, like both of you will never do that. And Speak so, for yourself. Maybe. So the, the Submariner we've seen on the wrists of James Bond uh, a, a few times, on the wrists of, of actors, models, things like that. The Submariner is, is kind of part of our cultural DNA. You know, people know the Submariner, even if you don't know watches at all. The Sea Dweller is not that. The Sea Dweller is something else. It is, as I've said before, arguably one of the least commercial products they make. They don't make that many of them because people just don't buy that many yeah. of them. It is something that represents the other side of Rolex. So there's the commercial side, which is selling the two-tone date just to, to every mom in suburbia. And then you also have this side where they are truly innovating and pushing things forward in a way that almost no other commercial watch brand does. So the Sea Dweller represents kind of the pinnacle of engineering as well as kind of this, this, this niche, niche collectible world. Yeah, definitely. And it's 50 years of focus. It's incredible to think, you know, saturation diving has been around, but like they've spent 50 years improving step by step to make sure that a couple of people who are doing it get the best instruments possible. 